Hello there everyone. My name is Athira and I'm from India. My colleague Pavna and I would be presenting about CubeSats, just an overview of it. So the main goal behind this presentation is to give you an insight as to how a CubeSat has evolved and also give you a few technical pointers to take into account when developing one. The takeaway here is to gain intuition on the basics of a CubeSat. So over to you, Bhavna. As William Burroughs said, man is an artifact designed for space travel. He is not designed to remain in his present state any more than a tadpole is designed to remain a tadpole. Warm greetings to all the curious minds present here with us today. I am Bhavana Savant from India. I branch from the roots that are nurtured by UNICEF India and TSC. To end the search and plunge into this metamorphic journey, one cube at a time, let us walk through time and space. Let us begin from inception. Who would have thought the first ever creature to jettison into outer space would be fruit flies? Yes, Drosophila melanogaster, otherwise called fruit flies, jettisoned by the United States on the 20th February 1947. 4th October 1957, the day that marked the beginning of space age. Soviet Union launches Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite in orbit. 3rd November 1957, Laika becomes the first to orbit in outer space on Sputnik 2, yet again by Soviet Union. Being on the outbrink of a Cold War, USA launches its first ever artificial satellite, Explorer 1, on 31st January 1958. While one could only wonder what lay beyond the horizon, Yuri Gagarin ventured out as the pioneer to seek beyond. The first man to orbit in outer space on Vostok, Soviet Union does it yet again on 12th April 1961. To keep the clock ticking, 16 June 1963, Soviet Union sends the first ever female cosmonaut who is even to this day the youngest and the only woman to have performed a solo space mission, Valentina Tereshkova. July 1969, a giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin set foot on Earth's only natural satellite. Well, they say great things come in small packages. Then why not satellites? While huge masses of satellites were pushed into orbits, time called for a revolution. Can you imagine crushing a satellite down nearly 3,375 times and yet obtaining your desired results? Here's a new chapter. To mark the inception of a new space era, Bob Twiggs of Stanford University with Jordi Pug of California Polytechnic State University cradled the idea of CubeSats in 1999. This was a mission driven to promote and develop the skills necessary for designing, manufacturing and testing of small satellites in low Earth orbits. So what is a CubeSat? While satellites came in all shapes and sizes, CubeSats laid the foundation of the first universally accepted standard. One unit of a CubeSat or 1U is defined as a CubeSat with the sides of 10 cm or 4 inches. Typically, the mass of a CubeSat does not exceed 1.33 kgs or 3 pounds per unit. The most popular sizes of CubeSats range from 0.5U, 1U, all the way up until 6U, U being its unit in decimeters. This idea of Bob Twiggs and Jordi Pug saw its existence on the 30th of June 2003 when the first CubeSat was launched from Placitsk Cosmodrome, Russia. From space in Cold War to space for humanity, we have come a long, long way. This collaboration between US and Russia personifies the same. 
From the start line to the finish, or rather the destination, it is the journey that truly matters. With massive technology and investment in launch vehicles, what do CubeSats demand to be launched in? Well, it's rather simple. There are three main ways in which we can achieve this. The first, with some help from the International Space Station, small satellites are changing the model of launching new tech into space. The CubeSats are transported to space station in soft-sided bags by cargo ships, such as Japan's H2 transfer vehicle HTV, and at an appropriate time, satellites are taken out from the station cabin and are aimed at their planned orbit. It is then that they are released via a robotic arm. The second method. One can call the CubeSats smart hitchhikers. They ride on the coattails of large satellites. When a large satellite is set to task, CubeSats are well accommodated in the space unused by the large satellite. Finally, more often than not, there are also dedicated launch vehicles for CubeSats. For example, ExoLaunch, a German-based launch service, is aimed at deploying small satellites only. SS-525, developed by JAXA, launched 34 CubeSats on February 3, 2018. CubeSat missions Apart from being used for low-cost missions, CubeSats can be used in various ways to meet diverse needs. Solo mission CubeSats Here, one CubeSat is intended to perform one independent specific task. In the case of CubeSat constellations, Several low-budget, efficient satellites can not only replace high-budgeted space missions, but also provide a better coverage or scope. In case of CubeSat swarms, they intend to provide higher efficiency and lower rates of failure along with better coverage in the field of communication. Amongst the many fascinating CubeSat missions, here is a peek into a selected few that might interest you. STAR The Space Tethered Autonomous Robotic Satellite A Kagawa Satellite Development Project at Kagawa University, Japan Launched on the 23rd of January 2009, it was a secondary payload on H2A. It consists of two sub-satellites, KU the mother, and Kai, the daughter. They were tethered by a 5-meter tether. The mother extended its arms to the daughter, and the daughter was intended to take images and understand the attitude of the mother. Hence, Kukai. Who would have known that a low-Earth orbit satellite would one day make it to Mars? Well, perhaps it is soon going to make its presence felt on Moon, as well as Jupiter. Mars Q1 Marco is the brainchild of NASA. Launched on the 5th of May 2018, Marco consists of two 6U CubeSats, Marco A and Marco B. Launched by Atlas V401, each of them weighed 13.5 kilograms. A Mars flyby, it was meant for communication relay test. QB50, a constellation. Initiated by Von Karman Institute, an EU mission, QB50 demonstrates the possibility of launching a network of CubeSats built by university teams all over the world. A network of satellite for in-situ measurements in the lower thermosphere can only be realized by using very low-cost satellites and CubeSats are the way to go. QB50 CubeSats are 2U in size, and 36 of 50 CubeSats were launched by 2017. The next gen of CubeSats are the CubeSat swarms. With the ability to provide autonomous spatial and temporal resolution of targets, having higher data rates, they harvest the potential of low mission failure rates. They also provide global coverage. 
Having taken a quick insight into the world of CubeSats, know that there are myriad possibilities and unprecedented opportunities. I hope for you to be the nebula of innovation. Create, unleash, let the CubeSats fly. I would now like to hand it over to Athira to take the session further. Now that we know how CubeSats have come to life, let's look into why CubeSats have gained popularity among universities or rather space communities in general. Let's also go a little technical and see what are those layers of bolts that go inside a CubeSat. Now coming to our question, why are CubeSats so popular? There are multiple reasons, but I'm just going to list a few of them which I find the most important. When you look at the image here in the slide, you can see a trend. A trend where an old mobile handset has gone through years of revolutionary changes and has evolved to what we now call as a smartphone. This evolution was possible thanks to the process of miniaturization. Essentially, in miniaturization, the component decreases down in size with the same performance or better performance. Because of the blooming nanotechnology, transistors are scaling down in size to such a huge extent that you can now build better optimized devices that has an amazing performance. Say for instance, you have a space mission which requires a scientific instrument. Perhaps a few years ago, that instrument would have been bigger in size, but now due to miniaturization, it is possibly smaller. So you really don't need a huge satellite to carry that instrument and of course all of the components in the satellite would be small as well. The CubeSat or any nano satellite can just do the job and hence why it is one of the reasons for its popularities. I think this slide speaks for itself. It is undoubtedly cost effective. The structure, the components or the modules that go on the board are not so pricey as compared to building bigger satellites. Hence students or individuals with less investment can venture out into space. Moving to the next reason. These days you see a lot of space enthusiasts coming out with great space missions. With the CubeSat, they can now conduct scientific experiments in space that will help achieve their mission. And you know there's a huge chance that your mission could fail miserably in space. But as you're using a CubeSat, then a huge, bulky satellite, the losses incurred are relatively less. I suppose that's the bright side of a failed CubeSat mission. Last but not the least, reaching out to space was perhaps a dream that could not be realized by common people. Fortunately, we now live in the new space era. Initially, space was only accessible to the government or public sectors, but with the advent of nanosatellites like the CubeSat, private sectors are popping into the field of space as well. Common people can now realize their space dreams with a relatively less investment. These are the main reasons why CubeSats are so popular. All right, moving on. Let's now dive a little deeper into the boats you see here on the CubeSat. They represent the subsystems of the CubeSat. There are quite a few subsystems, but I'm going to focus on the three main subsystems that are usually considered the most important subsystems of the satellite. But before we get into that, I'm going to talk briefly on what a payload is, just to get a little more intuition. Now, a payload represents the function or the mission of your satellite. Say you wanted to conduct an experiment, maybe to check the temperature gradient of the atmosphere, or you want to check the ion density, the sensors or the instruments that aid these experiments can be the payload. There can be multiple payloads, so it's not just restricted to one payload. Say if there are two payloads, they can usually go by the names of primary or secondary payloads. Apart from the payload, the structure and the subsystems form the satellite bus which support the payload. Let's now dive into the subsystems of the satellites. Let's talk about the first subsystem. It's commonly called as the brain of the satellite. This subsystem is called the OBC which stands for Onboard Computer. It is responsible for monitoring the satellite data handling where the data typically comes from the payload and other components or sensors present on the board and it commands what the satellite should do. It basically governs over the entire satellite. The main component of the OBC is a computer of course. 
choosing the computer must be critically done. The first question that pops into your mind probably should be, would you use a microcontroller or a microprocessor as your onboard computer? To answer this, you first need to check what will be the gravity of task you would want your OPC to perform. Say you take pictures of Earth from the satellite and you want to process the pictures on board to remove noise from the picture, then you'll have to choose a microprocessor. So large data handling tasks can be efficiently done by a processor. If the tasks are small, simply to maybe collect analog or digital sensor data, a controller will just do fine. If your satellite is going to collect sensor data and you use a processor for it, it is an overkill and a weak OBC design, so avoid doing that. There are other factors that decide which OBC you can use. The sensors or other electronic components communicate to the computer through various interfaces such as UART, which is a universal asynchronous receiver transmitter, SPI, serial peripheral interface, I2C or I2C, which is the inter-integrated circuit, etc. So depending on the type of interface your sensor needs, you need to see if that interface is available on the computer. The speed at which the data is transmitted is different for different interfaces. So keep this in mind while choosing the interface for the sensors as well. There are other factors you need to consider when choosing the computer for your OBC. The first factor would be RAM. If you have longer programs or multiple programs or large data that needs to be processed, bigger RAM size will run the algorithm faster. Suppose if you're going to retrieve the CubeSat after it descends from space and you want to collect the data from the satellite, you can use a SD card that can store the data, although it is not mandatory to have a SD card. GPIO or the general purpose input output is the next factor. You'll have to check if sufficient pins are available. You can have two computers as redundancy where one would be the main computer. In case the first fails, the second can continue monitoring the satellite. So your OBC is not restricted to just one computer. Digital analog pins. Like GPIO, you need to check how many of these pins you require and if the OBC has sufficient pins to suit your needs. Crystal frequency is an important factor. Higher the frequency, faster the performance. If you have a long set of instructions, higher crystal frequency is preferred. But if the tasks are not of prime importance, smaller frequency will suffice. Power constraints. You need to make sure you have enough power to run your OBC. We will deal with this a little bit later. Not just that, sometimes the sensor operates on an input voltage of 5 volts, but your OBC only provides an output voltage of 3.3 volts, which clearly isn't sufficient. So take these factors into account while choosing the OBC. Having a brain is simply useless if you don't have the energy or the power to perform the task given by the brain. That is where this system called the EPS comes into picture. It is abbreviated as the electrical power system and as the name suggests, this system provides and distributes power to the components present in the satellite. When you're going to design the EPS, you have to choose the source or the sources of power. If you plan on having the CubeSat to be in the orbit for a couple of minutes to hours, then you can use batteries such as lithium ion batteries. But this is quite uncommon because most CubeSat missions would want to ideally stay in the orbit for a couple of days to months. And that's why you will need solar panels or solar cell arrays to generate continuous power. Generally, the solar cells are placed on most of the sides of the CubeSat. This is because you never know which side of the CubeSat would be facing the sun. In case you're putting one or two solar panels on the CubeSat, then you should make sure the CubeSat faces the sun whenever it is in the vicinity. For this, you need help of another subsystem called ADCS, which is the Attitude Determination and Control System. This system will help you to maneuver or orient the satellite. The batteries used are generally rechargeable. There'll be times where the sun will not be in the vicinity. That time, the solar power generated to charge these batteries can be used. The other important components of the EPS are voltage converters. Some components might use 3.3 volts, others 5 volts and some 9 volts. You can't keep three different batteries to generate this. Instead, you use converters. Say you have a 3.3 volts power source and you want to step it up by a notch to 5 volts. That time you use a boost converter. 
In the reverse scenario where you have a 5 volts power source and you want to step it down to 3.3 volts, then you use a buck converter. There might be a scenario where you have a 5 volts battery and you want to sometimes step it up to 9 volts or maybe step it down to 3.3 volts. In that case, you have a module called the buck boost converter. Moving on, there are other factors you need to account while designing the EPS. For example, the dimensions of the battery or solar panel. You need to make sure you can fit the battery inside the satellite and also make sure the dimensions of the solar panel can provide you the power you require. Another factor is the discharge protection circuit. At times, the battery can be discharged at its full capacity. This is known as deep discharging or over discharging. This reduces the lifespan of the cell or the battery and that's why you need the discharge protection circuit. You get protection circuit ICs in the market that will do the job of protecting your system. Not just for batteries, but most of the components will have a temperature tolerance. You should always make sure the components you use for your satellite can withstand the wide temperature gradient of the space environment. So in case your battery can't survive the temperature gradient, you can make sure your battery can operate in optimal conditions by using battery heaters. For example, you can use a battery heating pad. When you have solar cells in the picture, MPPT or the maximum power point tracking is vital. This ensures maximum power extraction from the solar cells. It basically has a charge controller that has an algorithm to ensure maximum power is extracted from the solar cells. MPPT checks output of the solar cells, compares that to the battery voltage, then it fixes what is the best power that solar cells can produce to charge the battery and converts it to the best voltage to get maximum current into the battery. Communication is essential. You might want the satellite to communicate with you when it is in the orbit or you might want to send commands to the satellite. These commands are referred to as telecommands. To achieve this, you use comms, which is the communication subsystem and this is the last subsystem I'll be talking about. From the diagram, you can see two different frequencies. When you are sending a signal from the Earth to the satellite, you use the uplink frequency. Similarly, the satellite can communicate to Earth stations using the downlink frequency. Both of these frequencies are different. Had they been the same and if the satellite and the Earth station were communicating at the same time, there would be a clash in the messages received or rather a distortion in the information. To avoid that, you keep the frequencies different so that there will be no interference. The uplink frequency is usually kept higher. The reason for this is that at higher frequencies, there will be a loss of signal, that is the signals keep fading as you see in the diagram here. So more power is needed for reliable transmission. This power can be easily generated on Earth but it is difficult to generate on the satellite and that is why satellite transmits at lower frequency. Of course, you may think that you can use two different frequencies which are low, but the problem is that the atmosphere reflects the signals back to Earth if they are of low frequency, and hence those signals won't be able to reach the satellite. Well, when you're transmitting information from Earth to satellite or satellite to Earth, you need to choose the modulation technique. The modulation technique decides in which format your information is transmitted so that the information will be received with less attenuation in the signal. You have different modulation techniques like ASK or FSK and there are plenty more. The modulation technique that is hyping up in the industry now is LoRa which stands for long range. It is a spread spectrum modulation technique usually used for long range and uses low power. You need to choose devices that transmit these signals as well and these devices are called the antennas. I'm not going to explain on this more as another presenter from this webinar series will present about ground stations and antennas extensively. There are a lot of chances that your information will be altered when received. So you need to make sure you have an error detection and correction algorithm. Let's look at the diagram over here. As you can see the data bits are 100, 1011. That is a transmitted code. In the receive code, it is 0001011. So the first bit has undergone a change and that is the error in the receive code. So the P over there stands for parity bit and this parity bit is used to indicate if there is, the, uh, if there is an error in the code or not. 
So hence, you need to use an parity error detection to detect these errors. That was pretty much the overview of the main subsystems of a CubeSat or generally of a satellite. Let's discuss how you can start designing the CubeSat. This is just an insight and so it's not much in detail. The first step is to create a team. Delegate the work or tasks to the members of the team so that the development process can be faster. You can have different members working on different subsystems. As the subsystems are dependent on each other, the team must effectively communicate with each other on their progress and let each other know how they are designing their systems. Once you have a team, identify the mission of your CubeSat. What do you want your CubeSat to do? This primarily locks the payload of your CubeSat. Next, sketch a timeline for your progress. This will assess the progress and the pace of the task being scheduled. The next thing is you need to develop on the concept of what your CubeSat is going to do, which subsystems will be present, which modules you would be using, etc. Here you will have to extensively read a lot of data sheets to see if the components suit the requirements. Once you have a rough idea, you can pitch your CubeSat mission and concept to secure funding. You definitely need money. Make sure you have sufficient funding to proceed with the project. Next, start working on the design of the CubeSat and test it. This is a highly iterative process. If it doesn't function as expected, go back and work on the design again and test it. You need to do other testings like vibration testing. You need to find rocket launchers, get approval from space organizations of your country, etc. There is a lot of work, but if you have dele delegated the work, keeping the timeline in mind, your mission is clearly achievable. This was just an overview of the CubeSat design process. We have come to the end of our presentation. Start looking into other CubeSat projects so that you will gain an idea on how to develop one. We hope you have now an intuition of CubeSats and what factors should be considered while designing the CubeSat. Thank you for watching this video and if you plan on realizing your space mission, good luck with it.